Welcome, totally human listeners, to Neighborhood Watch, a narrative horror podcast set in the RPG world of Hunter the Vigil. Due to adult language and violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 3 Containment My name was Jillian Gunthry when I lived in the mountains. It's a simple life. You hunt, you skin, you clean, you eat, you gather firewood, and you keep yourself busy. When my boy Charles was 16 years old, he met a young woman and got hooked round the groin like a largemouth bass chasing a worm. That blonde woman he followed with eyeliners and blushes so thick they could be war paint, was a member of a traveling church that come through town. Reverend Colby ran the weekly gatherings out of a mobile home in the remains of a half-built Super 8 motel the developers gave up on. They called themselves the Reintegration. My husband, Clad, was immediately friendly toward them, never able to tell who was being honest with him. So when Charles didn't come home for three days, of course it was up to me and the gun three wives to bring him home. It was a full moon that night. Me and my battalion of sisters-in-law watched the shadows of the vinyl tent from outside. Reverend Colby was in red robes he'd never worn his normal Sunday lectures. He was holding snakes too dozens of snakes and walking through the crowd. One of our undercover gals spotted Charles and a few of our neighborhood boys kneeling up front. They were shirtless and red-eyed from days of not sleeping. Their hands were cuffed behind them and their chests were peppered with blacks and blues, greens and yellows of bruises, both old and new. We had binoculars, a compass that weren't pointing north and some giant steel box with a kind of scraping sound coming from within. My mother-in-law spat through her six teeth and said, The hands will always move toward other demons once they recognize them. Looks like we got our target, ladies. I took it all as metaphor and like a good sheep as I attached the rifle scope to my borrowed version of the gun three. Reverend Colby removed his sunglasses for the first time, and we saw signs of a green steam and eyeballs that gleamed like camera lenses rather than wet human eyes. He called to the pit, called to the structure, and when that blonde hussy pulled out her jade-handled machete, we made our move. If you want to be a coward, go after a child. You want to be stupid, go after a woman. You want to be kept alive long enough for the trauma to set in, go after a woman's baby. Mama Bear ain't negotiable, nor patient. She just rampages forward. I took my clean shot. I blew off the reverend's head, and the snakes in his hands latched onto the stump of his neck, and they curled themselves into a scaly orb a substitute full of eyes and tongues and rattles for eyebrows. It turned toward me, and I took another shot straight through the chest. Some of the other cultists ran into the hail of gunfire outside. Some of them fired back. None for long. When Charles's grandmother and I approached the tent among the chaos, the blonde showed us her fangs and held Charles hostage with the machete. Charles begged for me not to hurt her. I took my shot and relieved her of her head too, and some of Charles' shoulders. But he healed within a few minutes, as he always had since his operation as a child. I kicked my boy in the face and I said, 
This is why you always bring strange girls home first, so Mama can't approve them or not. Now wipe off the shit off yourself and get in the car. Three of our own were bearing down on the steel box that helped us identify the false Reverend Colby. The box was rolling aggressively toward the remains of his body, the melting gray muck steaming and smelling like a burnt circuit board. Years later, when I ran away again, I would find the other pieces of the thing in the box, and I'd take them with me as I took off up north. But we'll depart from that story for now. Do you remember the white van that was following my friend, the plastic surgeon? Well, that white van started trailing me, which is what I wanted after all. If they were monitoring the black boils, they probably wanted to know about the person investigating them, which means they have information that I don't. The white van was parked two blocks from the sixth floor walk-up studio apartment I had borrowed temporarily. My cell phone was inside, placing a call to a 1-800 number, giving them a signal they could trace. And they were tracking it, of course. I waited until three armed men in nondescript gray clothing left the van, and then my boys double-parked the garbage truck, blocking the white van against the curb. The drivers had already been paid off by Bishop Mancini, the man from Rome, so they weren't going to move none. I opened the van and stepped inside, and I surprised the young man handling the sound equipment. His eyes bugged wide when I closed the door behind me, and I pulled up an upturned Home Depot bucket to take a seat. His eyes went even wider when I rested the barrel of the gun three against his chest. Do me a favor, hun, and don't signal your friends, I told him. Two minutes of uncomfortable silence later, I heard the explosion over his headphones, and I knew we had the rest of the evening to ourselves. The man in the van tried to tell me that we were on the same side, though we don't know it. He struggled quickly, and he handed me a file with an address to a man named Dr. Miker. Dr. Stephen Miker, biologist, immune defense specialist, drug pharmacist sellout till he got recruited by a subsidiary of the Charon Group. He got recruited to pull together their research that they had collected across the other worldwide hunter conspiracies. The ones I'd never join up with. The Ascending Ones. The Maleficarum. Project Valkyrie. Everybody. Thing to keep in mind about hunters, dear. They're just regular people like anybody else once the target is silenced. Means even if they have the same goal, they got different methods, different loyalties, cash the checks at different banks, and very different ends justifying all kinds of terrible means. I just stepped into something much bigger than me, and I need to gauge how bad the situation is. I took the vial of black boil sample I had on me, and I unscrewed the cap slowly. My new friend with the sound equipment bolted to the other side of the van. He held up his hands and slowly pulled a wad of cash from his pocket, trying to slide it toward me with his foot. I keep coming closer, and he starts putting on a little show. Please! Please! He said as I held the vial of skin samples closer to him and started to turn it. Dr. Miker was nuts, yes, but he was one of the good guys. He's been, he's been missing for weeks now. That file he's got is the last known research lab that he had here in the city. You don't understand. He took his results, he went rogue, but his research was good. Sincerely on the side of good. We weren't stealing information that wasn't already given to this collaborative effort. Everything was given. He was just playing with what we had. We were trying to save people. We're still trying to save people. It was all about strengthening the immune system against the kind of things that we fight. Please, please put that away. 
Sending a couple of armed men into a person's apartment is a really indirect way of helping. I balance the open pill container holding the black boil sample on his knee, and his hand shook. I took the file, the cash, flipping through it to make sure there weren't no tracers on it, and I closed the door behind me. Seems I also accidentally kicked the van's emergency brake, making it lurch backwards suddenly. I don't need to tell him that they're just blueberries and vinegar. He seemed like a smart boy. I guess he'll figure it out eventually. A little while later that same night, I check my leg again. Totally healed. Not even a hole where the screw penetrated it little under a week ago. Makes me wonder exactly what I got shot with. It's about two hours to sunrise when I head to the 24-hour diner to meet a friend. She's wearing a Christmas hat on purpose and already has two plates of waffles in front of her as I arrive. Lena's earrings jingle and ping when she looks up to see me, and she takes both my hands into hers, hugs me tight, and she sits down, beaming. It's impossible to tell her age, somewhere between 30 and 300 would be my guess. Lena was a heavy part of the theater and drug movement of the 70s, although people who lived it can barely tell the two movements apart. She used to rent out people's apartments to perform Shakespeare. Drowning Macbeth in the bathtub, play stab Banquo behind someone's leather love seat, right in front of a mat of shag carpet, snort a line of cocaine off of a prop sword. One night, she partied too hard, and as she puts it, she awakened. Spotlight turned off her and faced the rest of the world. Now she just watches lives as they pass her patching up or tearing down what she deems necessary. Under the table, Lena holds my hand gently the whole time that we're together, and I can see her reading my past, looking beyond my eyes to follow blood cells running through the veins in the back of my brain. Her smile drops when I take out the sealed container, the one holding the real black boils. She shudders at their sat. Her earrings jangle in disapproval, and she grunts. She stares at the vial I've brought, and I swear half her jewelry points upward like a puffed-up cat when it's cornered and about to hiss. I watch her eyes go entirely white, then black, then green, and then back to normal. She asks me to take the container away. She don't want to touch it with her bare hands. Okay, okay, these boils are part of a reaction. Uh, they're not the cause, but they're the symptom. You build up a spiritual gunge on, on your soul, and it clings, and oh, and it weighs you down, and ha, ha, and you try to breathe it off, and your immunities, they build up a wall, they draw a line, and they dare the invaders to step across it. Your immune system becomes a weapon in response to an outside threat. Every weapon is a response to a direct threat. Weapons don't develop in a vacuum. When the disease crosses that line, the line your immune system drew, it starts to bite, and it attacks, and it copies the sin and hands out propaganda pamphlets to the rest of your body as it starts spreading the word, hosting gospels, poisoning the well against this wolf in sheep's clothing. I really need you to speak in English, Lena. Was I speaking in tongues again? No, you were speaking in Lena. Oh, that's much worse. I apologize. What you have is not from a human. It's from an animal with a far more advanced immune system. What builds up an immune system? Exposure. I'm thinking you have something from either a pigeon or a rat or a pig. These boils are cages, a reaction to something beyond horrific. I don't want to know what these boils are keeping out. I didn't look through them. But they're a reaction to fluoride, uh, the teeth-hardening cleaner chemical that the New York State pumps into our tap water in order to kill virus and strengthen our teeth and make us click on pop-up ads. I tell her about the ghoul from the sewers. I tell her about his equipment. 
Lena finishes her plate of waffles before she speaks again. She swirls the whipped cream in circles with her fork, adds a dab of maple syrup, orange juice, cuts the whole circular pattern through the middle with her finger. There's a chance, she says, that the man you are after was trying to help. Can't condone this kind of field testing without consent of the general public, but if Big Pharmaceutical was funding him, then what would he care about, right or wrong, anyway? What if he still did and that was the problem? What if he did have a conscience and that's what made him go rogue? Or what if needing to see good in the world made him go crazy? I think we're done here. I need to pay her now. Lena nods to the man at the register, who nods back. She takes me by the hand and walks me over to the ladies' room. It's not what I want, and it's not what she wants neither, but it's part of her ritual, and there's a lot worse that she could see fit to take from me. This ain't the worst. She buttons up my shirt when she's done and goes back to her booth for her next appointment. Breakfast is on me, Madge. Just get the bastard. And quit smoking. When I walk back to my car, there's a creamsicled colored cat mewing across the street. He's not even ducking under the cars away from me, and he's got a collar on. Tells me he's used to people, and probably needs help. It mews when I get near, and I turn my head in time to see something crouch behind another car about five parking spots down the street. Something saw me and ducked. Am I being followed? No, I'm being targeted. A car is suddenly launched into the air at me, and I duck just soon enough before it smashes into the jeep next to me. Something stands up, looming, taller than a man and far too wide. Whatever it is, growls. Not like a wolf, though. I've seen skin shapers before, and this thing ain't made of muscles the way a Stallone movie is made of muscles. It's just made. I need to get to my car and pull out the gun three. My sidearm ain't gonna do nothing but pop like a cap gun against this thing. It's too big. I make out the shape of its head area, and I can see it undulating under the edges. It ducks low, probably lifting the next car to throw at me. I move to the car behind mine, hoping that it's gonna land and topple over and block the street. I pull out my side pistol out of my jacket, and I wait. My ears are buzzing with adrenaline. No one else is on the streets though, no window is open. I move to the same side of the street as the crouching thing, the giant. Nothing there but a pile of rats. A car-sized pile of rats is oozing slowly into the sewer grate. They swarm into a circle and drain themselves beneath the street. I take an orange parking ticket off the car next to me, and I make a little ball, and I light it with my lighter. I toss the fiery scrap into the mass of rodents, and I can see their tails are tied together, and some are stuck within the fur of each other. They're all trying to run in a different direction, but the mass doesn't let them. It's a black hole of flesh and teeth. They're called rat kings, and they normally don't last too long in nature. A whole colony of rats get stuck together under filth and fur and shit and tied tails. The last of them squeeze into the sewer grate, and I hide my gun, no longer feeling safe on the streets. When I get back to my car, the orange and white cat is cowering on the trunk. I figure why not bring him. Already pulled too many people into this case. Might as well bring someone who can actually sniff out the rats. I drive to the last known location of Dr. Miker. I've got maybe a half an hour before sunrise. Whole building is demolished, of course. Construction sign outside says it's been bought up for commercial and residential use. The construction sign has a movie poster for Deadpool over it. There ain't no construction going on here. 
I'll sneak past the fence, and of course, there's no construction equipment. It means whoever wants to find Dr. Miker couldn't find nothing and gave up. <laughs> Just like men to give up when there ain't nothing in front of them they can see. Tons of graffiti, though. Very fresh stuff, maybe a few days old. Gang signs, street tags, something about the voodoo lady blood magic among a whole wall of rock and roll lyrics. I know this place is abandoned, but it ain't uninhabited. Nothing ever is in this city. I'm hoping I can corner whatever wild goose I'm chasing. I just hope I found something to corner. I do some testing round the wreckage, the fallen concrete pillars, scattered panes of glass that used to be windows. The cat's not left my side, and it sniffs around, eventually running between two toppled slabs of concrete that are forming a triangular doorway. I shine my flashlight, definite footsteps in the gravel and dust, air is drafting up, slightly warmer than the air around me. I get near a crouch, and I shimmy my way in. Sure enough, there's some kind of ladder that's leading down. I got the gun three drawn, and my flashlight attached to my shoulder holster, pointed down into the depths. And like any hunter too stupid to bring back up, I go down alone into the darkness. Neighborhood Watch is part of the Chroniclers of Darkness. It is written by Uncle Yo and produced by Jimmy Lin. Original music produced by Jimmy Lin. Excerpts from the album Hexed used with permission from Anders Manga. Special thanks as always to White Wolf Publishing and Onyx Path Publishing for giving us a whole new world of darkness. Without you, our paranoia wouldn't be nearly as charming. What was that scratch? Okay, it's gone. Comments, questions, extra scrap silver laying around you'd like to donate? Leave a like, share, or a positive review on iTunes. Or join our doomed cause on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Uncle Yo. This podcast is supported by patrons like you at patreon.com slash Uncle Yo. So check us out and help fuel the vigil, because the nights are getting longer. Game on. Include everyone, and remember that death is more likely than retirement. But at least you won't face retirement alone.